Okay, welcome back everybody. So now we're going to look at part G of this problem. We've already gone through in problem 91A, we went through all of this. In my most recent video, we just did part F. Part F was calculating the probability of committing a type 2 error, so that's incorrectly accepting a false null, given different values for what the actual population mean is. Calculating those probabilities is kind of a, a, a theoretical concept because calculating the probabilities relies on having this information that we don't have. If I had that information in reality, why am I doing the test if I already know what it is? So the whole purpose of that exercise is really to give us some idea some understanding of how our exposure to a type 2 error changes and our, our power of our test, that is correctly rejecting a null hypothesis, how that changes with the proximity of the true value when it satisfies the alternative, when it gets closer to that hypothesized value. So if the alternative is true and very true, meaning the actual population mean in this case is way less than 12, it's really unlikely that we'll commit a type 2 error. The power of the test is much larger than if we look at a situation where the alternative is true, but only just barely true, right? And so we've gone through, and here's my mess from the previous um, the video, and we saw that if the alternative is true, but just barely true, it's really difficult to correctly reject and really difficult to, to identify um, what, that it's actually true. So that's all fine. We understand that. Now, how do we actually control our exposure to it? Because that's what's interesting. That's what I have control over is my exposure to a type 2. Just as we can control our exposure to a type 1, which is as simple as choosing our level of significance, I can also control my exposure to a type 2. Now, unfortunately, it's not quite as simple. So I'm just going to clean up, uh, clean up some space here. I might need some room. This is all fine. Okay. That's probably good. So, I'm going to write uh, a little bit more generically, but we will stick with this particular context, of course. So, that will be our, our prevailing um, test, okay? Now, when we went through in the previous video, remember, we always assume the null is true unless we have evidence to show otherwise. Now, I'm going to keep a little bit generic here, and rather than write 12, I'm just going to write mu 0 for now. That's our hypothesized value. Now, in the previous video, of course, we, we talked about how the process of hypothesis testing is that I have the, the standard normal distribution. Uh, I draw some sample from here. I standardize it. And then we can look at it in that standard normal. And we compare it to that critical value. And that critical value defined whether or not we accept. Again, I'm using quotation marks only because we're talking about type 2 errors. Normally, we would never say accept. We would say do not reject. But that critical value delineated that uh, either where we accept or where we reject. Now for the discussion of type 2 error, I want to come backwards, starting with that critical value and convert it into what we called an X bar star, which is that sample mean that would translate directly into our critical value. So, if I would reject for any test statistics smaller than that critical value, 
that's the same now as saying I'm going to reject for any sample mean that is less than x bar star. If I accept for any test statistic that is greater than that critical value, well, now that I've solved for x bar r, I know that I'm going to accept for any sample mean that is greater than x bar star. Now, in that previous video, of course, then we had these possible realities where what if the actual population mean, one that does satisfy the alternative, so here's mu a, and I'm drawing it in a way that it does satisfy the alternative, that it's less than that hypothesized value. And then we brought this down here. Here's that x bar star. And then we calculated this area here as beta. And of course, remember, this all corresponds here. This was that area alpha. So I have alpha, my tolerance towards committing a type 1 error, I can see here. And here is where, in the previous video, where we calculated beta, probability of a type 2 error, which was reliant on that difference between mu a and mu zero. Now, those two values are exactly the same. X bar star are exactly the same in both of those um, in both of those distributions. So, what does that mean? Well, in the first distribution up here. I can define that x bar star as being that hypothesized value minus that critical value and that standard error. x bar star here is that true population mean, mu a, that satisfies the alternative, plus z, now this is beta, because that's a, the z value that corresponds with an area of beta, sigma root n. So if both of these equal x bar star, well then I can set them equal to each other, And that equals this one, mu a plus z beta, sigma root n. And now, what are the things that we can control for in any given test? Well, I have a hypothesized value. I can choose my level of exposure to a type 1 error. Beta, well, that's my probability of committing a type 2 error for a given value of the um, true population mean, one that satisfies the alternative. So what are we going to do with this? We're going to rearrange it and solve for n. So that now I can decide If I am willing to accept some particular level of exposure to a type 1 error and some particular level of exposure to a type 2, if the true population mean is whatever it is I'm comfortable with, whatever is the magnitude of the error that I am okay with. So in this problem, this gives us all of the information that we need. If the manager says that she is willing to risk a 1% chance of not rejecting the null if the average volume is within one ounce of specification, how large should the sample size be? 
So it should be 12 ounces, right? That is what the, the bottle of beer here is supposed to be. That's the label on the bottle of beer should be 12 ounces. Here we're saying I'm willing to accept a 1% chance of not rejecting it if it's within one ounce of what it says. So one ounce from 12, so that would be 11 ounces. So again, that's a number that satisfies the alternative hypotheses. She's willing to accept a 1% chance of believing the null if the alternative is true with a value of 11. And I'm choosing 11 again because it's within one ounce of specification. And specification here is 12. So 12 minus 1 is our 11. So how do I incorporate that into our formula? So once more, we want to solve for our sample. So Z alpha, this is our critical value that corresponds with the size of our rejection space. Alpha here was 0 0.05. So we know from previous exercises that we've done that that's 1.645. Z beta, okay, well beta, this is given here a probability of 0 0.01. Well, let's go to the tables and see what that is going to be. This is all still messy from earlier exercises. So I want 0 0.01, which appears to be, oh, well, right around here. Let's, I guess we're not gonna be exactly precise, but that's about as close as we're gonna get to 0 0.01. So that's going to be a value of 2.33. So I come back up here, there's 2.33 squared. Our variance from this exercise is given to us here. Well, we have our standard deviation is 2.1. So that's going to be here 2.1 squared divided by the difference between our hypothesized value and this value that we are comfortable with at the 1% chance, right? One ounce within uh, from specification. So that's the 11. Good, so now we just pull out our calculator and here I'm going to have, oh, we better get some brackets here, 1.645 plus 233. And that's squared times 2.1 squared equals 69 divided by, well, that's just divided by 1 squared, so that's just 1. So... There's our answer, 69.68. Now we can't have a sample size that is a fraction of a number. So we'll just round this to 70. And that's it. So with that formula, now I can say, okay, if I have a sample size of 70 observations, that allows me to now perform this test at the 5% level of significance, so there's my exposure to a type 1 error, and with a sample size of 70, I know that I risk only a 1% chance of committing a type 2 error if the average volume is within 1 ounce. So if it's at 11 ounces, which of course that means the alternative is true, but I'm only risking a 1% chance of committing that type 2 error if my sample size is 70. Good. Okay, it's, understandably it's convoluted. Type 2 error problems are always quite challenging 
to go through. And often when I teach this in a classroom, I tend to have to go through it a couple of times. I don't know if that speaks to my ability or inability to discuss it, or if it's simply because it's a complicated topic. Nonetheless, we will go through a couple of more examples so we'll get a little more practice. And like anything else, with a little bit of practice, hopefully you'll just see what's happening and you'll understand a little bit better just what we're doing. Okay, thanks for watching.